Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome back from your tea break. Um, just a quick announcement that this session will not have simultaneous translation, unfortunately, but we will have question and answer at the end, uh, where we will have the capacity for translation, and Tomoko has kindly agreed to help us. So I'll just ask her to translate that before we sort of start, and people are trickling in. えっと、皆さんお茶を飲んだ休憩が終わって戻ってきてる頃だと思うんですけれども、次のセッションを始めまして、あの、先ほどと同じように、あの、プレゼンテーションは英語で行われて、残念ながらちょっと通訳をつけ
What sorts of vision, artistic and otherwise, has he spearheaded the kinds of relationships that he wants to cultivate with audiences or spectators? What has he set out to look at and what has he done to engage with the work of creating, developing, curating, dramaturging a festival for Singapore, which is Kang Sen's home country, birth country, however, is a place that he has frequently moved in and out of as well, particularly in the last couple of decades, I would say. Um, Sounds a little bit old. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that a good thing? No, that's okay. You're not a spring yeah, chicken? Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> Otherwise, we'd be suspect. <laughs> Um, so, what is the consciousness of this public space, this city space, uh, and what is the political context into which this festival enters? So, thank you, Kingston, for doing this and being open to this dialogue session. We will have time at the end of it, as has been said earlier, for questions from the floor. So, hold on to your questions as they emerge. So to begin, I just want to start with asking very basically, what does it mean to talk about dramaturgy of a festival as a festival director and as somebody who has got specific ideas about the thematic trajectories that you have created for this festival and a festival for Singapore. Thank you. Um, very nice to see all of you. I'm sorry that we had to shift uh, the talk to today from 18th um, and hence we have no translation so um, of course this is always a, a little bit of a tragedy when you have no translation but uh, uh, I hope that everybody will be okay. Um, well I think that in terms of festival dramaturgy um, I think there's a, there's a way in which uh, the, uh, uh, the festival puts a frame around that period of time that it's uh, it's playing uh, and uh, it, it could be a theme it could be a way of uh, of uh, engaging the public uh, it could be a way of um, um, of of uh, putting certain politics to the forefront. So I think that's, for me, a, a kind of festival dramaturgy. There is, of course, uh, also, it's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not stable in the sense that it is, it is uh, in transition all the time over the number of years. And even within the frame of, let's say, the six weeks or four weeks, uh, there, are, there, there is a kind of a journey, I think, a trajectory. Okay, so just to... Sorry. So just to fill the audience in, <laughs> Kengsen has already put together three festivals and is putting together one more, which is the last one in this series for now, as it were. And for those of you who aren't aware, the themes have been 2014, Legacy, 2015, Post-Empire, and 2015 was significant in Singapore because it was 50 years since independence and the whole year was a celebration, Post-Empire. 2016, Potentialities, and 2017 coming up, Enchantment. So tell us a bit about the selection of these particular themes and how they worked individually and together. Well, actually, the, the themes are always... Uh, I, I try very hard to put the themes in plural, mainly because uh, it's, uh, it's uh, about pluralities and multiplicities. So it's legacies, for example, and, uh, and uh, uh, it's always a big debate. Like now this year we're doing a, a, a project called Open Parliament. And of course I said that, well, let's call it Open Parliaments. And then somebody in my, in my team and my colleague uh, who is uh, in charge of the, uh, the Open in terms of all the engagement, she said, uh, Nolina Mohammed, she said that, Mm, sounds a bit strange because usually it's only one parliament, right? So, so, um, but this idea of plurality, and uh, um, we started with legacies, and I wanted to have a, a way to to um, reframe this kind of often. Um, this, this journey of moving back in time and moving forward in time and the past, present and future and that we are at, at any one time existing in these three, uh, at least these three frames, if not more. And I, I wanted to, to look at legacies and not so much histories, uh, mainly because I think legacies felt a little bit uh, broader. So we had legacies of science and we had legacies of violence like apartheid, which came from the 20th century. So it was a kind of immediate uh, reflection on the 20th century um, uh, mm, 
misdemeanors as well as I, no, actually they were mostly misdemeanors. So so uh, it was uh, it was legacies, and then post empires was more. I think that it was uh, looking at at very strongly at the individual and looking at archiving and uh, in specific how uh, individual archival processes are redefining the empires from which we have come from. Um, and then last year was looking into the future, but it was uh, framed more as potentialities rather than future, right? So, um, um, and this year, I think that this year is a very, um, well, when I, when I first agreed to do four years of the four editions, I said that the last edition will be kind of the wild card, right? Because it's like, it could be, it could be, actually I thought that it was just going to be a summary of all the three years, you know, because we, we are always living with legacies and we're always living with potentialities at the same time. And, um, but then, you know, post Brexit and post Trump and, uh, um, and I often like to say that Singapore has pre-Trumped, uh, pre-Trumped Trump. And uh, so, so this idea that um, perhaps uh, in this kind of age of disenchantment, we have to look at enchantment uh, seriously. You know, how do we continue to be enchanted with the world so that we can uh, fight for it and we can, uh, can sustain because we can still believe and not become cynical in the process. So unpack a little bit what are some of the strategies then once you decide on a theme and you have an idea of how this theme is meant to connect with an audience, a potential audience, a legacy of an audience. Um, what are the kinds of things that begin to inform some of the strategic decisions, choices, and planning processes that go into place? I, I, I suppose that um, uh, it's, it's usually a kind of a, a landscape that uh, we are in, like a domain. So we enter a kind of a domain and in a way we move through the domain of, let's say, legacies and maybe, uh, mm, I, I suppose, coming from a, a generation that's, that's kind of not the digital generation because in that year we did, we, uh, in the first year of legacies, we invited Hans Orego Brist, for example, to talk about, to do his project called 89 Plus. Uh, they were uh, focused on individuals born 1989 and after, mainly the digital uh, age and the digital generation. And I don't come from that generation, but I suppose that in a way, Mm, looking at a kind of a postmodern and beyond postmodernism, a way of kind of uh, fractured, fractured uh, uh, surfaces, perhaps reflecting each other. So I, I, I normally do think of of working through a number of different uh, uh, lateral ways, rather than um, rather than trying to go, you know, to building a kind of monolithic uh, approach towards legacies. And this, I think, is it's something which is quite interesting because I've been asked before, let's say for the open, why is it that uh, I don't become more didactic, you know, kind of teach the audience what to think about legacies. And of course, I, I just don't really think this is possible and it's not, it's not also the agenda. And particularly, I think, um, in, in Singapore, uh, which is so top down i 've seen my role as the festival director in a very specific way and one and the main the main the main thing that I would say is that I see my festival directorship actually as an intervention uh, on many different levels it 's an intervention into the city you know to kind of uh, um, in a way cut into the cut into the, the policies which uh, politicians make about the arts in Singapore and also to also perhaps disrupt some of um, the kind of capitalist tendencies of the city. So, you know, I, I see my festivals really um, as a kind of, um, as a, kind of a, a, a pause, you know, or a, a way in which um, there is an interruption of the festival process in Singapore. Um, and I think this is very important and I, I, I do always reflect on the fact that being an artist, what does it mean to actually uh, run a city festival? So I, I consider that as one of the biggest um, um, frames that I use, which is that I see my festivals as an intervention. Yeah. Very interesting because earlier we were talking about rupture. 
And that notion of how something is not destroyed, but troubled, interrogated, taken off. Um, a word which Peter introduced into the discussion this morning. Um, but before we go there, and I'm going to pursue that a little bit further, but before we go there, I'd like you to talk about open, because I think that's a significant intervention in festival programming in a way. It's an aspect that hasn't been there in the festival before. So what led you to generate open? And what, well, firstly, what is open in your perspective? And what led you to make that happen? I, I suppose open is a kind of a, it's an open space, so it doesn't have a, it doesn't have a, a particular fixed format, but it's a way in which I, I do believe that festivals, and this is my own frustration as an audience member, right? Let's say, for example, you see uh, Gob Squad, or you see maybe a, a, sh a show, let's say, that's happening here, like, okay, Api Chapong, you go and you see Fever Room, and you want to, you want to know a little bit more, because, but then he's gone, right? He's gone, and the, and the show disappears in a few days, and uh, there's always this frustration that you're chasing after a UFO that's landed and, go and it's going off again. So, so it's uh, unidentified, you can't really, you get some sense of, oh, I think this is some vague, sense of the, this is what the Martians wanted, but uh, um, you can't really confirm and um, and this vagueness is what I think the open try the op open tries to create an ecosystem right an ecosystem before before the festival arrives where uh, audience members are thinking about um, are thinking about potentialities for example and what does this mean so it happens correct me if I'm wrong about two months beforehand it happens in June the or the festival begins August September yeah it, it happens June July and then there's usually a month in between yeah and it occurs slightly differently also because the way in which tickets mm. and programs are framed um, is not the usual festival ticketing programming thing so just talk about that talk about the open pass and how that encourages a certain kind of viewing that's not your typical conventional yeah. festival. I, I, I think that one of the things which, which we are always uh, uh, working with in, in, uh, in festivals is about pricing of tickets, right? This is always, I mean, not just festivals, but even when you run a theatre company, you're thinking how to price, how not to discourage uh, people who cannot afford. And I would say that in Singapore, most people can afford. It's just how people want to spend their money. And um, and in a way, it's it's also about um, trying to create a, a flexibility of thought, you know, which is a I kind I, I suppose is a kind of a post discipline uh, or in, at least interdisciplinary to post disciplinary process, whereby you actually move between uh, a film and uh, a, a talk like today, and then maybe the next day you are in a photo exhibition. The sense of being able to, to slip and to actually kind of uh, transition between these genres. Um, and the open pass allows, let's say like for $25, a student can actually watch uh, 70 events in, uh, in three weekends all on that same pass. So it's a, it's a very, very, um, I, I don't think that, that uh, audiences in CIFA are at all prohibited by pricing. Uh, but of course, it's also a kind of a way in which I, I do believe that as you're slipping between the genres, as you're slipping between the disciplines, something productive happens. So, um, uh, and the open operates on that way, where you, you are actually put into a kind of a, a mm, maybe a mind fuck or a dream state where you're moving you know, between all these things and uh, without, without an audience choosing, because usually the audience chooses, an audience member chooses, let's say I have $50, what can I watch? And these are my top three things. And we actually try to, to create that, that, that sense where you, can, you, can, you don't have to feel the pressure. Yeah. So, Tell us then how that pertains to your thinking about Singapore as the city where this festival is happening and why in particular uh, your reading of Singapore as a city, as a city state, as a nation as well, then warrants this kind of 
open session before the festival and an ongoing commitment to that way of presenting the festival, that there is always a festival, but there is always open beforehand and there's a different layer of thinking or a different approach to working that is specific to this Singapore that you're, you're responding yeah, to. Yeah, I, I think that um, uh, Singapore for me is a, is, a, is a land of censorship, right, where you are very often uh, directed to think in a certain way so you have a you have a, a pathway which you follow and you very seldom are allowed to discover or to um, to fall because you're not even allowed to fall so basically uh, you are supported in 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 a way which is very very um, I think um, where you actually start to 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 think only of not just the possible, but the successful possible. And, um, and because of that, I think the open allows for a, for a space where actually you're not told wh why you're watching it and how you should be thinking about it. And this kind of openness, I think it's, it's really important as a kind of, um, as a kind of life experience. And, and so the festival tries to, to to draw on that, and I suppose that you know, I, I do think that a festival responds to the city, responds to the context in which the festival is in, and I think that uh, I was asked by Charlene yesterday about like, um, uh, uh, what do I think were the moments where I think that okay, the festival has worked, and I, I gave her an answer which I think um, you know because of course as you are as you are talking, you are discovering certain things, and I think that. Uh, for me, I feel the festival is is particularly successful when it makes the political processes success uh, transparent. So, actually, when a play is censored and the festival production is censored, that's when the process becomes the political process becomes transparent. And actually, that's when I I kind of feel that as an intervention, we've uh, we've collided against the wall, and that collision. Um, becomes visible, and uh, the invisible political system becomes visible. I'll give you an example. So, at the time when uh, we publicize productions, is usually in April, and the festival, let's say, is in June or in August, and uh, the, the plays are not yet uh, classified, or the productions, the dance, is not yet classified, and uh, so it's always uh, said something like, rating TBC, rating to be confirmed. And so, Actually, this, this then becomes our kind of leverage because then when a performance is censored or disallowed, audiences begin to ask, why? I bought the ticket for it. Why is it uh, taken off the shelf? Right? And, and this is when the political process becomes transparent. And of course, what the censors want us to do as companies, as artists, as festivals, as institutions, is to pre-censor so that the audience does not know that they are denied this show. But when you say our uh, rating to be confirmed, they, they want to see, let's say, Api Chapong. And then it's taken off. And then they begin to ask, what, why, what, 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 was, what was wrong about the show? What, uh, which scene was problematic? So this is when the, the political process becomes visible. And I think that the, the festival as a, um, um, as, a, as a kind of a national performing arts festival, as a clustered series of events, becomes very visible and politically very strong. And in that way, I think that um, I see my, my office actually as a, as a public office. And uh, I, I see my way, my intervention as a festival director almost like an ombudsman, right? Which is, an, again, another legal term where you actually um, create a kind of a check and balance and you reveal some of the, some of the, the quiet censorships that are happening. Ombudsman. I mean, that's really about mediation, a facilitation of a process, and a very different kind of role to the assumptions made about director. 
Uh, I mean, earlier, obviously, we were talking about the dramaturg and what kind of role is that and, and what are the hierarchies of that kind of collaborative process. So say a little bit more, please, about this notion of ombudsman uh, when the title is festival director, and here we are talking about a dramaturgy of it or dramaturging it, um, because the festival is meant to have a national role to play, as you say, and I think public office is interesting because there's public interest engaged with public office. It's meant to have this national role, and in Singapore particularly, it's meant to be a highly attractive hub for a range of things to happen. So infrastructure and a range of support systems go towards that. So then if one is ombudsman, one is assuming conflict. Because you rarely go to an ombudsman or a mediator if there isn't some conflict that needs to be settled. Uh, and a conflict that needs to be settled outside the right of the law, one that is more humane, hopefully, one that is more geared towards the people who are involved. So how does that work? Okay, so for example, I mean, the reason why I... Uh, am I... Am I... I'm, I'm, I'm... Okay. Uh, I think that one of the... One of the realizations that happened for me when I started to be festival director was that sometimes I'm dealing with uh, Singapore commissions which run up to three hundred thousand dollars Singapore dollars, and the festival supports the entire commission. So that's about maybe uh, very easily one hundred eighty thousand euros, for example. So one production itself, and um, and you know. I have been questioned before, you know, of course, uh, uh, sometimes you get the National Arts Council breathing down your neck and saying that, uh, why are you commissioning this artist? And I, I say, well, because he's interesting or she's good. And, uh, and uh, they will say that, but uh, it, don't you think this, uh, this, uh, mm, there are some issues in the work? And uh, you know, this, all these euphemisms are always uh, floating around. And also because we're, we're having a situation right now where um, uh, funding is being pegged to um, being aligned with the party in many ways, right? So in that sense, uh, um, uh, uh, there is a situation where companies are denied funding because they are critical or they are, they are, they are maybe not exactly penalized, but they're definitely um, uh, affected in the, in the funding process. So I see, I see my, my work uh, then as a way to, to actually negotiate that because I sometimes commission artists which uh, are difficult for the system. Right? And, uh, and that's because I can see very directly that you know, when, I, when I give a commission to an artist of 180,000 euros, that's substantial money and it allows uh, some kind of uh, process of, of opening up uh, and making transparent certain uh, democratic thoughts, for example, in the city. I mean, it's, 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 uh, it's I think, just the specifics of, of how funding works in Singapore, where you, know, you, you, you don't normally have a festival uh, commission commissioning alone that, um, that kind of big production, right? Because you have, uh, let's say you have a budget of 180,000 euros, it'll be shared with between six parties or six festivals. So, uh, so because of that, I do think that there is a, a, a public role in, in the position of festival director. And I've, I've, I've been quite, uh, um, uh, I, I know, for example, that you know, I've been very strong with my board, for example, because I say that uh, I say things like, I, I, I'm not here just to uh, turn in a, a, um, a profit for the company, but I see how, how we have to use monies because the arts is the public space. And uh, it's not, so I, I, I don't stand for the National Arts Council and neither do I stand for the private uh, uh, profit-making process of the company that uh, holds the, the festival. Yeah. We could go on, but I'm going to move on to this idea of public space then, because you talked earlier about um, the festival as an intervention into the city. And so what, what are the kinds of interventions, ruptures, that you perceive happening with audiences, with spectators who come with particular kinds of intentions for viewing, or who are more open, or who are really kind of seeking to scale themselves up or 
learn or you know there's a range of kinds of ways in which audiences are participating in this work not just by buying tickets obviously but being part of an ecosystem some becoming volunteers some actually being parts of production some of which you know take on the role of ushers in outdoor events i mean there's a range of ways in which this ecosystem is operating and so what kinds of interventory you know interventionary if there's a word um sites are you imagining when you think about intervention for audiences? I mean, first of all, is, is it okay? You can, you can hear me, right? It's, uh, uh, I think that um, I'm, I'm dealing with um, imagined audiences. You know, Benedict Anderson talks about imagined communities. And I think that there is uh, no such thing as who's your audience, because you cannot predict or you cannot, uh, no matter how many surveys, you know, I mean, are there any survey companies here? I think survey companies are the, 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 the easiest way to make a fast buck because they can they survey and they say, oh, your audience is uh, generally young, mostly women, all professionals. And it's like, okay, I don't need to do a survey and I know that. You know, so so the the thing about about uh, the audience is that you you really don't know who your audience is, and therefore you have. You, but how do you deal with that that vacuum? You have to de then imagine an audience, and um, and I I love this uh, uh, well this art collective in uh, um, Zagreb called uh, uh, What How and for Whom, and I always use their their way of organizing my thoughts, uh, especially in a in a kind of a quick lecture like this, like what how how and for whom. So, so one of the hows I think that the festival is very um, strong for is that we try to have intimacies with the audience. So we reject um, a kind of uh, um, uh, strategies of 1,000 people or 3,000 people in a, in a football field. We don't really believe in that kind of uh, process. And mostly, you know, and I, I remember a, 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 a funder who said to me that, but how can you justify supporting a show with 25 audience only, you know, uh, or 15 audience uh, members? And, uh, and I said to her, I said, um, would you like your child to go to a classroom of 40 students or 15 students? You know, because it's, a, it's, a, it's almost like, um, like uh, one of the things that we do, therefore, is that we we try to do projects which uh, perhaps like like in 2015 we did a project called Open Homes, which happens in the, the home of uh, of uh, an individual, of a resident, and these open homes are, are usually only like 15 people can fit into the room. And this year, for example, we have a project called Open Kitchens. Uh, we have a we have a. Uh, we're inviting a Lebanese food activist. Uh, his name is uh, Kamal Muzawak, and he has a tagline called "Make food, not war." And uh, um, and uh, and you know, there's so much uh, silent censorship in Singapore right now that I think that we are in some kind of cultural war at the moment. Uh, but again, always invisible. Um, and uh, so. We wanted very much this idea of make food, not war, and to open up into uh, 18 home cooks who are cooking in their homes for audiences. But of course, again, 15 people, maybe 30 people if you're lucky in the house. Um, and um, this idea of this intimate experience rather than uh, something with a thousand people. Um, these are all deliberate ways to, to reinvent uh, uh, looking at performance indicators, because one performance indicator, of course, is numbers, right? How many people came to your show? How many people? What is your cost recovery? All these things which are, uh, are, um, are insidiously being um, appropriated by different arts councils, right, around the world. It's not just uh, in Singapore, but they're all learning from each other a kind of language, uh, which is that uh, how, uh, how effective is your art making? Um, and we we deny that uh, we deny that instinct uh, or that that uh, accounting process by actually saying that we want intimacy, and uh, we um, we actually uh, uh, push for that as a how as a strategy of uh, trying to reduce um, um, this sense of being in the mass, so to speak. Yeah. 
So it's interesting for me as an educator, somebody who teaches at the National Institute of Education, that's how entrenched in education I am, that the analogy you presented to this funder is of a child going to school, right? And the association is that for schooling, uh, you want good education by having smaller numbers because of quality interaction. But there's a different pedagogy that's at work in what you're doing in relation to this public space, not necessarily a schooling, in which you are intervening or you're seeking to intervene in an imaginative literacy, if I can call it that, where the imagination is meant to operate according to certain rules and stipulations, and you go to learn how to do art appreciation, you go to learn how to do music appreciation, drama, dance, and then you come back with the right words for it. But here, you're suggesting something else is, is operative, um, political, sensorial, and something about the pedagogical then links back to being director, ombudsman, mediator, dramaturg. Yeah, I think that, uh, well, in that particular case, um, the, the, the funder was looking at uh, funding education in the arts, so that's why the specific example of a classroom. But uh, um, I, 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 I do think that, um, and that's why I keep talking about this idea that, that the festival which I'm creating uh, is an intervention. And I, I'm, uh, I'm also very happy that it's happening only for four years because I think that as an intervention, you cannot be a sustained in intervention forever, right? You, you, you constantly have to come in and intervene uh, as appropriate for those number of years. And, um, and so I'm a, I'm a completely, uninstitutional person, non-institutionalized, and rejecting this institutional process. Um, and I, I think that this sense of being some kind of a, of a, of a foreign body, I'm a foreign body, I'm an alien or uh, 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 with viral potentials uh, for uh, the National Arts Council, because they, they, they probably felt that after a couple of years, I would uh, become less virulent, but I become more, or perhaps more, um, you know, I've sustained that. And uh, being this foreign body, and, and hence also a kind of a constant suspicion of the other. So I'm, I'm very much, uh, I, I, I have been uh, seen to be disloyal because I'm a disloyal artist who constantly bites the hand that feeds them. Right, so this is a this is a kind of a this is the kind of uh, public speak in Singapore, right? They was, they would say something like, you know, how how can you as an artist bite the hand that's funding you, and um, um, I, I and so that's why I feel like there is a kind of a specificity with this festival that I've made here in Singapore. It is very specific to that context, and I think that all festival directors, the dramaturgy is very much linked to the city that they are um, making the festival for. So how much are artists aware of this going on when they come and be part of the festival? How much are they conscious of these broader questions that they are in some ways either participant in or implicated in or empowered to then take further in relation to how they want to see their work and engage their work in relation to other works because there is a, a conscription in a way of their work and how they operate if this broader agenda is also operative, right? Yeah, I think that I think that for the international artists who arrive, uh, they are probably not so not so uh, uh, privy to all this background, mainly because um, uh, they may not be um, touched by censorship. And you know, there's there there are many many standards of uh, censorship or classification, as the ministries call it. Uh, many many standards of classification. So, for example, um, uh, I I think that if uh, um, if there was nudity sustained nudity in a show by an international artist, it would probably be okay. But with a, with a Singapore uh, group, there would be issues, there would be questions. So, um, I, I mean, a very stupid thing, like, okay, so you have a, you have a production about an art studio with a, with a nude model. And, in, and for a Singapore group, they're told that you cannot be nude. 
you must wear something. And it's like, okay, this is a drawing class, so do I wear a brassiere and, uh, and do I wear my underwear as I'm standing there in the, in the, 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 in a new drawing session? But they probably wouldn't, wouldn't say that with an international group, for example. So you have these different standards of, uh, of censorship or classification, and I think that, um, uh, I think that most uh, Singapore artists are very privy, and they, I mean, because we, um, that there, there, there are times when we have to be strategic. There are times when we discuss, um, uh, as uh, the artist and as the festival director, what is the best way to, to, um, to clear the path for this work to happen. So that's that's very that's very often, and and you know it's it has so many ramifications censorship because you 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 just have like thousands of people running after. The censor, right? Because you know, it, even as uh, as much as that, we have to have a clause in the contract, for example, that okay, uh, if the performance is censored, is almost like force majeure, right? So therefore, the contract stops. And um, uh, how would the artist be remunerated? How would the festival? Uh, what are the relationships um, between the commissioner and the commissionee, so to speak? Um, and these are all. So I would say all the Singapore companies are very privy to this conversation because right from the very beginning you are inside that conversation. Uh, I mean, and of course, you know, uh, different people uh, become complicit in different ways, and even myself. And so this this was. Um, one of the things with, and I, I think that you know, it's uh, it, um, the the National Arts Council always says that you know why why do you all have to talk about censorship all the time? Um, because you are doing so many other things. Why do you want to concentrate on that one work that's censored, for example? And uh, what they don't realize is that it is it is very very basic to the process of art making because you you become complicit in so many different ways. Um, and, but however, with an international um, production like Five Easy Pieces by Milo Rao, uh, that was a, a production which is about um, uh, pedophilia and performed by uh, young actors, young audiences, you know, so, um, and it was rated R18, which means that the only young people or children in the performance were the actors. So can you imagine how cannibalistic we were as the audience, you know, watching a, a play being done by seven children between eight to 12? You know, it's really like, okay, so let's eat them. That's, 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 the, that's the, 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 the kind of structure which then makes it so problematic. It's not just the play being classified or censored. It creates a kind of a culture of, um, um, a culture of uh, how should I say, of ungenerosity. You know, this is, this is what happens. So it seems like a lot of the dramaturging, I'm gonna bring it back to that before opening the discussion to the floor that you're doing, is making links. And, and sometimes suturing them, sometimes leaving them open. But seeing the associations that are possible as a result of certain choices that are made and therefore put in motion. And that this kind of dramaturging work um, involves an aesthetic consciousness, a political consciousness, and of course a capacity to then have a wide network of ways of working that make it possible, uh, apart from you know, a team that is working as well. So if I can just go back to the idea of dramaturgy and your being a performance maker and therefore being involved in the dramaturgy of particular kinds of work which are intercultural, interdisciplinary, and therefore drawing on difference and difference being a key part of this. And, a lot of the festival has brought in different forms, different countries, different ways of engaging um, material, but also sensibility, I would say, so affective in that sense. How would you suggest that for the purposes of somebody who's thinking of creating a festival, is a new festival director, is negotiating festivals because they want to be part of festivals, how does one read the dramaturgy of festivals and work within these dramaturgies or resist them 
contest them, oppose them, but you know, begin to have a literacy that doesn't mean that that leads to an artist or a producer not feeling okay. I just got to go because somebody's asked me. I suppose for me, it's it's about the the dramaturgies of ownerships. That's really a very central uh, thing for me. That how how the audiences can own what uh, what they're doing in those ten days or three weeks, and uh, and so in a sense, uh, for whom is this festival for? And I think that. Uh, uh, of course, there's also a kind of a luxury in Singapore because there, there are so many festivals. There's one festival every week, so you know. So uh, we are just one of a very uh, multiple, multifarious landscape. So, so, uh, so I have the the luxury, and also, and also that I I insist on saying that well. Uh, this is a festival for those who want, who desire it. So it's not just the artists, but the audiences. And so it's not a festival for all members of the everyone on the street. And I, I, I actually uh, uh, say that very directly to the National Arts Council. That it's not for people who are just on the street. It's it's about people who have made a commitment and a choice to be there be it as an artist or an audience member. And so the, there is a kind of a, then the, 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 the question then of what ownership and how, and how do you own a, a, a festival that's actually being uh, directed by somebody that's not you, but you are an audience member. So there's, there's, a, there's a lot of this sense of like, mm, I would say like uh, making transparent um, your thinking process is quite important, I think, because when it's transparent, then ownership can start to creep in and people can can um, uh, dialogue, resist, or, or um, uh, disavow the festival that you're making because it is transparent. So this, this sense of, like for example, we are, we're now, Elfian's involved in this and several other playwrights as well. We are making a project uh, called Open Parliament, which will open the festival this year. And Open Parliament is uh, it's really, um, um, having three new plays being uh, presented to a public jury and the public jury will decide whether the play is uh, is to be censored or not and uh, it's a really uh, confrontational process so we might be banned and uh, um, because of course the, of course the the media development authority uh, the IMDA doesn't want to talk about censorship. They prefer that it's, it's hidden. There's no censorship in Singapore. And, and uh, when you have this public jury, 50 members uh, every night, uh, looking at this, these works, which are being read, perhaps, uh, you begin to see that uh, it's very, very, it's transparent and it's frightening. And, and um, you have to, the, the, the volunteers have to stand up in parliament because, you know, we have our, our old parliament is now in an arts venue called Arts House. So you can actually sit in the parliament where the prime minister used to sit and stand up and discourse on why this play should or should not be performed. And um, this kind of not just uh, uh, having an opinion, but being, but Pinning the opinion to your face is so it's almost never done in Singapore. It's, it's hidden behind so many layers. So it's a it's a it's a it's a kind of a, a work which uh, I think is quite uh, confrontational. But at the same time, it perhaps has to be done uh, in this last uh, year of the intervention, right? That perhaps we we do have to uh, then see uh, what's at stake. What's at stake is that what's what's hidden behind this very opaque, like, oh, you know, sometimes you just get a newspaper thing that said, oh, this, these, these performances are disallowed because they're not rated, you know? So like, not rated means censored, right? So, uh, so I think that, that it's, it's this, the mediation is uh, in a way to make something transparent, I think, at least in, in, in the, uh, there are many different ways of mediating, and this is one way which, uh, which I have chosen, but at the same time, it is about getting this uh, buy-in also from the artists and from the audiences, and and that's why we say that it's only for the people who really have a desire, because for many people they don't see censorship as affecting them. 
open parliament. I think it's time to open the floor to dialogue from these not so very opaque faces in front of me. Um, questions, and if you have a question to ask, um, there's a question right here to begin with. Please put up your hand so that the mic can come to you because we are translating, and then Tamako, if needed, will uh, you will translate for. Good question. How many people here need translation would like into translation. Je uh, would like translation? ま、ちょっとあの、これから<笑> One person, maybe you want to come and sit beside Tomoko. Ah, I know. Ja, Nihon Show your face, show your face. Come, come, don't Sit, sit with Tomoko, yeah. Okay. So basically, I just okay. translate whatever Japanese. Into English for you guys, okay. De Mosi Nihongo de Simon Saretai, Katagaira Shatara, so Ego Nishimas no de. Do you go to the Daisho Deska? No, no, we need translation. Thank you so much. Okay. Hello, I'm, I'm Walter Hoyne from Tanzquart here in Vienna. I very much appreciate your, your presentation and I'm I'm very much a, fr a friend of your thoughts. Uh, from my own experience with working with certain topics uh, in festivals or, or research events, I would like to know a bit more about how you're constructing your topics for the festival and whether or not there are first artistic works or first is the topic. And... Um, how you differentiate between the topic that you develop for the festival and just a motto for a festival, like you know, like just a, a buzzword uh, that kind of rings a bell to people, but uh, uh, in, as opposed to uh, really have a concise planning of a of a of a content. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, I think for myself, um, I very seldom, um, um, I'm not so linear in a way in which I'm constructing the, um, the content of the festival. Of course, there is a, as I said, it's kind of a landscape where there are high points, low points, and it tends to be more fluid. Um, I, I think my, my most... I would say that I do have some um, kind of uh, building blocks. So like, for example, when I look at post empires, I'm looking at the individual uh, as opposed to the empire. And uh, uh, for example, I also look at archives and how individuals are archiving. So through these individual ways of re-archiving the empire, um, you also start to break down the, the monolith of one empire into many small empires, perhaps. Um, so there are some, there are some uh, building blocks. Um, and I think with, uh, with disenchantment and enchantment this time, um, I, I, I feel like there is a kind of... Um, I usually do work with a book or with a, a theorist, for example. Um, so, for example, with Enchantment, I'm working with a writer called Jane Bennett. And uh, she has a key line which I love very much, where she talks about how enchantment is the antidote to cynicism. That you have to not be cynical and you have to remain enchanted with the world. 
so I, I, I do have these uh, key words and key phrases which then allow me to, um, to enter into the curation. So like potentialities, I, I work with, uh, um, uh, um, of course, some theories, but also the idea that the potential is also dangerous and um, uh, rather than, let's say, a much more rational way of looking at the positivities of potentials, but that we are, we are often looking at the ambiguity of potentialities as well. So who is... Is there go, is, is Xinjiang or Uyghur land in China, is that a site of terrorism or a site of potentiality? So, you know, this kind of questions, I, I, I would say like, I, I have these um, little, um, little steps or little pointers. Um, and uh, I very, um, I would say that very seldom do I start with wanting to bring a particular artist. Um, and partly because this is uh, uh, the way in which I, I, I personally feel that there's been very little discourse development in performing arts festivals uh, because most uh, um, curators in performing arts are not really curating according to themes. They just say, oh, I like this artist. I want to bring this artist. I brought this artist last year, and so I will bring this artist again this year. And I think then it's too much artist-driven. And um, I, I, I actually think that um, it starts to, to kind of affect the discourse in performing arts curation. Because it's just about like, oh, I like him or I like her, but you know, but why? Why this year do you do this? Do, do you present him or her? Yeah. What else? Two hands came up at the same time. We'll go one at a time. Um, it's on. It's on. It's on. Uh, my name is Janice Poon from Hong Kong. Uh, I want to ask a question um, uh, from your observation or experience by uh, w when you talk to uh, the government or um, artists in Singapore. Uh, how, to what extent is your dramaturgical direction emancipating future directors of festivals or local artists? Or your dramaturgical direction is ringing the alarm of funders or the government in supporting future directors. I, th I think that uh, um, art is not something which is which can be docile. Right? That uh, 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 art um, art has an ambivalence and an ambiguity. And uh, so I think in trying to make something transparent, there's also then the, the danger that funders don't want to fund trouble, right? Um, and, uh, but at the same time, I think it's very important that, um, uh, that artists don't become too dependent. Like I, I always uh, cite the example of Singapore and Indonesia, that Indonesia has no money, no artist has any grant to start, but they are, they are so creative and they are making things from scratch, from whatever their, their Coca-Cola can or something. And, um, and in Singapore, very often the artist doesn't start until they have a confirmed grant. And I think that this this is a, um, a, a it's about a kind of a dependence, you know. And uh, I was very, uh, I've been very critical actually. I've been on like grant bodies, and I'm very critical about how uh, we are over granted. Uh, and this begins to uh, to take the edge out of um, of why an artist is making work. Um, I, I think that I think that artists should very often be supported by their communities, um, meaning that people who think like them, people who would uh, write a check for them, uh, even if it's just fifty dollars a year, 
and uh, these are, are ways in which um, I, I think that uh, the grant system has to move forward and the festival system has to move forward. Of course, then you, 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 you can't think big all the time. You have to go underground. You have to, you have to uh, do something with a group of people who turn up like you and uh, um, make an event. And in that sense, it's, it's more true to the landscape of Asia where I think that Politicians are very afraid of the arts because the arts is a, is a rupture to control um, and uh, um, it's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a questioning mechanism, it's a self-questioning mechanism in society. And I, and I think that as the arts festival, I, I, I have to, I, I'm very aware, for example, that you know, we need the money to make big shows. Um, and you can't always have um, small, scratchy solo performances, um, but you know this is a tension which, uh, which as the festival director, you have to, you have to think about. You know, so sometimes it also means that okay, let's just let's just cook for each other and not make a show. Uh, so this this idea of, uh, for example, in the kitchens, what's happening as you are cooking together. So it's it's not it's not that you go as an audience member and you are just uh, waiting to be fed, but you have to cut the chilies and you have to dice and you have to cook and you have to do things, not just wash the dishes, but you have to do things. So I think that this sense of um, of uh, bringing back art making to what we have, rather than always saying that it must be in a, in a big auditorium. Um, uh, some of these things I, I do value and I try to bring it in as part of the festival. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm just wondering if you could say a little bit more about the, the terminology of uh, um, your, your theme for the festival, um, Enchantment, I guess in the context of Singapore. Um, I mean, for example, why not vibrancy? Um, and uh, um, follow up from that is, maybe you could, I invite you to talk a little bit about the possibility or the role that dramaturgy might play to ensure that that term does not get co-opted as a kind of consensual euphoria, a kind of euphoric reverie that has becomes, uh, in a sense, a, a, an apolitical space outside of yeah. critique. Yeah. I, I, oh, I think I'm a bit... Am I hitting something there? Um, I think that uh, um, uh, part of the dramaturgical process, and that's why, that's why I think when Hong Yen was talking earlier about uh, how there is no dramaturg and uh, um, there's, there's at the moment we're talking about dramaturgical sensibility. I think that the, the dramaturg is the ombudsman in many ways in a process, right? You have a director or you have a, a, a number of creators and the dramaturg is uh, kind of sometimes uh, stopping the, the process so that you can rethink. Um, so that we we don't get oppressed, uh, we just not, not that we so that we don't just keep running with the ideas, but that we stop and we rethink. And so the dramaturg is for me uh, um, uh, someone that we we don't really have in Asia, and that's that's why uh, we were talking earlier. Hong Yen was talking about dramaturgical sensibility, and because that's because it's almost a a luxury to think of having somebody there to check and balance you so to speak. Um, but I, I, I think that um, it is important for a festival theme to be ambiguous, to be dual. Um, and so it's, it's not enchantment like Disney, for example, or escapism, but it is to, to have a kind of a turn um, uh, uh, a kind of a turn on the word enchantment, you know. So it's a, it's like uh, Eric Fisher lit talked about uh, effective turn. That this turn of effect uh, in performing arts, where you then become you, you own something because you have you 
you have effect towards this thing. Um, and this affective turn, so I, I like the, the themes to have some kind of potential for turn, so that it's turned on its head, for example. So actually in, in the way the, the um, you know, so usually we give some key thoughts about uh, the theme, like enchantment, we'll, do, we'll start off with like, oh, enchantment is a, a shot in the arm, it's an animation of ple animating pleasure. But then it gets more and more serious and it starts to become a, a, an antidote against control. Um, uh, it, it becomes a, a kind of a comment on the age of disenchantment that we live in, and I, and I don't think it's just Singapore, but I think it's very complicated right now, uh, be it in our base, Japan, or uh, Trump's America, or uh, um, Brexit UK. Um, these are all clear examples uh, of a kind of disenchanted world where people are very often not voting and, uh, um, and uh, not feeling that their vote counts, for example. Um, I, I, so this is, these, these are all parts of disenchantment, I think. So, of course, it, it, it can be, um, it can be anything, it can, it can be vibrant matter, it can be vibrancy, it can be vi vibration, but at the same time, I, I, I feel like um, I want the audience to to feel they understand the word, but then yet they don't understand the word. So there's some kind of um, duality of that term, which is interesting. And in terms of how of how um, the 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 dramaturg can uh, rethink the festival, which the festival director is thinking, I think this is really crucial. And of course, you know. Um, we become very used to wearing two hats. So we are Mr. Jekyll and Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, right? So we go A, B, A, B, A, B. You know, sometimes you're the director and sometimes you're the dramaturg because you are one person. And it, it of course, is ideal that you should have a dramaturg. Um, and I think that it's just being able to bounce ideas off and to, you know, we were discussing a little bit yesterday about what is the role of, uh, of a, not so much the role of a dramaturg, but when do you think you have been a good dramaturg? You know, um, when were you, effect I mean, effective is a terrible word, but okay, but when, do you, when did you think that you were, you were contributing to the process beyond just uh, being a logbook or beyond just being <laughs> kind of uh, watching the rehearsal and giving some comments. So I think that that um, um, a festival team ideally um, should have a dramaturg looking at the festival dramaturgy. Um, but this is something which uh, it's it's not yet there, of course. Um, I mean, usually, usually the uh, engagement director or the person who is doing conferences would be having that role, for example, uh, uh, of being the dramaturg in the f in the festival, um, and uh, and in in Sifa we have that person in Nolina. Uh, she's very involved in terms of just bouncing off, especially for the open, the pre-festival. Is there a burning question? Because time is up. We have exceeded our five o'clock uh, timing. But if there is a burning question, we'll take one more. Um, if not, I'm just going to ask Heng Sen to respond to the idea that this is an Asian dramaturgs network meeting. And we're trying to trace Asian dramaturgy. And as somebody who's been observing and watching and participating and curating, and in a sense, Peter's question leads nicely into this. Um, in your view, the notion of an Asian dramaturgy, what does that signify, bring up? Because this is one of the questions that we've been raising, and I know you've done a lot of work that you now term inter-Asian. Or intra-Asian. Or intra-Asian, which then raises... Intra-Asia, inter-Asian. And then multi-Asian as well, trans-Asian. But, you know, it's, it's a question because all the things that you've been identifying in relation to your festival in Singapore emerges from an Asian context. 
And first and foremost, we kind of tend to identify what is Asia by where we are. And so if this is Asia, then it counts. But if you're West Asia, obviously you count less because there's difficulty getting people from West Asia to be accepted as Asian. Where are they, you know? Um, so, yeah, I think as a final thought, this notion of an Asian way to approach the question of dramaturgy and the dramaturg. I, I suppose for me, it, it deals with uh, the politics of difference because uh, Asia, it's, it's not unusual for uh, most of us to be in a mixed room of Asians uh, where uh, we're speaking a default language of English. Um, but I think that, you know, it's, it's something which I, um, which I don't see so much when I am in Europe, where people are not so often talking about the politics of performance. Yes, everybody is political, but being in the same rehearsal room with many different languages, because it's almost like um, this is something which then has hierarchies and tradition and contemporary has hierarchies. Uh, the disciplines have hierarchy that, for example, film uh, uh, has perhaps a, hi a higher hierarchy today in Asia than performing arts. And um, in terms of, of funding, for example, uh, in terms of reach. So I think that, the, that um, in a strange way, the dramaturg in Asia has to address hierarchies. Um, so this is, um, this wasn't so much an issue in Europe, although now it's changing with, with, a, with a changing Europe, right? Who is, who is European? Um, and um, this, is, this is something which I think um, uh, it's very, very pronounced in an Asian dramaturg's role that he or she has to address the hierarchy of, uh, of uh, Ong Keng Sen in the rehearsal floor or Su Tadashi Suzuki in the rehearsal floor. Uh, um, uh, uh, but you don't have to do that if you are in Ariane Minushkin's uh, theater, she, th th there is no dramaturg addressing hierarchy, or you know, in Grotowski's theater, you know, for example, there is a kind. Uh, there's almost a a, a, a sense uh, that I think that the Asian dramaturg deals with negotiating hierarchies and negotiating these kind of potential divisive differences on the floor. I think. Yeah. Thank you very much, Keng Sen. Um, it feeds into many things that have begun to be discussed and will continue to be discussed. Thank you for articulating those ideas and those principles and those spaces and bringing that, making that available to us. Thank you very much, audience, for your time and attention. And please welcome me in thanking Keng Sen.